Good morning, my friend. Welcome back to the series where the twist is still the king and the past is a foreign country. And this week we look back agog with stupefaction at the magnificent beast that was the week ending February 25th, 1962. At number 10 is a former number one in The Lion Sleeps Tonight by The Tokens. Two weeks at the tippity top from January 14th, it has to be said that this record is one of the most culturally pervasive songs I can think of. Everyone from antediluvian coots like me to the youngest of music fans, I believe, knows, knows of, and secretly enjoys something of this wonderfully silly song. Somehow it's gone beyond pop culture into the cultural register of the world, and as mentioned, if you've never sung along to it, or clapped out a beat, or danced a little jig to it, then you are a very rare beast indeed. As is customary in these matters, following number 10 is number 9. And at number 9 we have a song beloved to the hardcore glam rock fans such as myself through its high-powered version by The Sweet. But this is the original Peppermint Twist by Joey D and the Starlighters. Like its later incarnation, it's brisk, it's energetic, and it is by the standards of the day quite wild. President Eisenhower once questioned the impact of the twist on America's moral values. I don't know. He beat the Nazis, so I guess he gets a pass on this one. It just wouldn't be the 60s without a Cliff Richard song in the top 40. And here, from the film The Young Ones, when the girl in your arms is the girl in your heart. Now, I'm going to be frank here, I wouldn't be putting this on my 20 Greatest Hits Cliff mixtape, but in saying that, even the 21st Greatest Cliff Richard song is still pretty darn good, and here he sings a straight ballad with his very warm and sincere straight ballad voice. And we all know how good he could be at this from listening to his masterful version of It's All in the Game from September 1963. Number 7 is another erstwhile number 1 in Sandy Nelson's Let There Be Drums, which held down the top spot for the first week of February. It hit a long time in coming, it was recorded almost two years before it made the charts here. This high energy puff of next to nothing obviously caught on with the surf music crowd, who along with the twist record aficionados, seemed to dominate the top 40 this week and had a short, lively and exceedingly merry chart run. At number 6, Mr Twister Chubby Checker was on the rise again with Let's Twist Again, Again. The ghost of which is currently doing the rounds as an obnoxious ad for, I believe, a supermarket chain. This was the second go round for Let's Twist Again, having previously spent seven weeks on the charts in August 1961, reaching number seven. This time out, it got as high as number four. Odd as that may seem, it's nothing compared to its predecessor record, The Twist, which we'll discuss later. Before we Fossick through the fondest favoured five for this week, let's consult Fowl's fun world of facts for some fancily fulfilling folder roll. The big riser of the week is Kenny Ball and his Jazzmen, who are up 12 places to number 17. And the big dropper was the High Priest, the Great One, the genius himself, brother Ray Charles, down 8 spots to number 27. And a record so racist it was even considered racist by 1962 standards, which in Australia is really saying something. Charlie Drake's My Boomerang Won't Come Back. It's awful. I mean, genuinely awful. I might also add that it spent two weeks at number one at the end of 1961. Oops. The only record of any interest entered the charts this week was Bruce Channel's monumentally annoying Hey Baby. Our American cousins were elevating Gene Chandler's epically groovy Duke of Earl to the top spot this week, while our British chums were sending one of the, in my opinion, greatest single records ever made, Wonderful Land by The Shadows, to the top spot. If I had to take one CD mixtape with me to a desert island, I'm pretty sure Wonderful Land would be on it. No report on the number one album, as we didn't have a local album chart until 1965, but were I to hazard a guess, I'd say ooh, the soundtrack to The Music Man. At number five is a great music man, the magnificent Bobby Darren, a man who was so stacked with so much talent it was scary. Of course, he was a man running out of time in more ways than one, and he knew it. Music was changing away from even his multifaceted talents, and literally because of a weakened heart from childhood rheumatic fever, the latter of which was to kill him in 1973. But this week he was zooming up the charts with one of the energetic rock and roll style novelty songs he excelled at writing and performing, Multiplication. 
The song that comes from the movie comes September, and it was on the set of that film that Darren met and wooed Sandra D prior to a tumultuous marriage. Multiplication was on its way to a six-week stay at number one across March and April. In what is a true cavalcade of hits this week, number four is probably the most obscure record in the countdown. Norman by Sue Thompson, which I would have to opine is deserving of such obscurity. A very nondescript pop song sung by Thompson, who was a sporadic hit maker with four top tens in Australia, in her irritating little girl voice. This song is trite and frankly pales next to the great songs that tower around it on this list. At number three, it's twisting time again as Chubby Check is the twist on its second chart run, gyrates statically at number three for the second week running, which was as good as it got for the Chubster. On its first go round, it only made number 10 and lasted 12 weeks, yet somehow, by David Kent's super secret algorithm, this was the 53rd biggest hit ever in my little hick town Hitsville, while Bobby Darren's chart behemoth multiplication ranked only 165th. <sighs> As Madonna once said, life is a mystery. That said, Chubby made a good career out of a second-hand hit, tried and failed by Hank Ballard and the Midlighters, and he's still twisting today, albeit he's a little slimmer and a little slower. The comic eater in the charts this week was Run To Him by Bobby V, who was an interesting chap to say the least. A longtime friend of Bob Dylan, whom he met as Elston Gunn, with three ends, whom he hired as a piano player despite Elston not having disclosed at the time he could only play in the key of C. He laid a cross path with Dylan on a number of occasions after that, culminating in Dylan inviting the Alzheimer's stricken V to one of his shows in 2013, describing him as the most meaningful person he'd ever shared a stage with, and inviting a round of applause from the audience for V, which was rousingly forthcoming. The Beatles also recorded his Take Good Care of My Baby for their ill-fated Decker audition, and somewhere along the way he struck up a friendship with Paul McCartney, which saw McCartney invited to England in 1999 to help celebrate the music of Buddy Holly. V having been asked to replace Buddy Holly in the 1959 winter tour when Buddy had come down with a sudden and unexpected case of the being deads. V was also scheduled to play a big package show in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, but that was cancelled for reasons I think we can all guess at. And V had a pretty fair career for a half a dozen gold records, this being one, albeit not the best of them, and he made his last record in 2014, two years before his death at the age of 73. And that just leaves one more step on the summit to the pinnacle of popularity in the city where the television started at 11 in the morning and ended at 11 at night. And it was a step taken by this particular man many times before. The number one record. Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis Presley. What's even more remarkable about this is that enough stores reported the B-side, Rockahoola Baby, as the selling side that it itself made number 27. So the both sides must have sold an inordinate number of copies between them. In the second of its four weeks atop the charts, the song was a bigger hit here than in the rest of Australia, where it tapped out at number three. The session notes for the song list the great Hank Garland on guitar, which would have been interesting because Elvis hated Garland and refused to be in the same room as him. Come to think of it, almost everybody seemed to hate Hank Garland. I'm not one of those people who subscribe to the line that music took a giant step backwards after the disasters of 1959. Certainly the wild men of yore had been domesticated, but we still had the likes of Roy Orbison, the Beach Boys, Del Shannon, Ray Charles, Dion, James Brown, Cliff in the Shadows, the Everly Brothers, Gene Pitney, a stable of stars at Atlantic, Elvis still had the odd great record in him, and if you went down to Nashville, country music was undergoing radical and exciting changes. Jazz was gripped by the technically fearsome and uncompromising hard bop tenor men. There was surf music everywhere. If anything, it was one of the most exciting times for the classic canon. And this week's super secret algorithm score of 6.7 out of 10 seems to bear that out. And on that upbeat note, I leave you. I would naturally treasure your reflections and comments and would swoon over your likes and subscriptions, but most of all, I would quiver with thrill to see you next week here where the past is a foreign country. <laughs>